Welcome to What CEOs Talk About. Do you wonder what CEOs talk about behind closed doors? How they bring their vision to reality? How do they overcome and succeed through adversity? We share that and so much more with each episode. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, everybody. My name is Martin Hunter. I am the host of What CEOs Talk About, where we translate uh, vision into frontline strategy. Today on our show, our guest is Mitchell Demeter, who is the president of NetCoin. And you've been the president of NetCoin for how long now, Mitchell? Uh, since August 2019. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, so uh, Mitchell and I, just before the pre-show, we're just kind of talking and, and kind of riffing and saying, what do we call this? What do we call this? What do we call this? So we don't really have a title because there's so many things that we want to talk about. We want to talk about explosive growth, right? How to lead an organization that has explosive growth, how to lead a, an organization that is in an emerging industry and then how to lead an organization that is in a highly scrutinized. So you can say explosive growth, emerging industry, and highly uh, scrutinized organization. Thank you very much, Mitchell, for being on the show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. How did you get into crypto? Tell us your story about you and crypto. Yeah, so um, I got involved into crypto back in January of 2013, actually. And... Um, I was introduced to it through a friend. Um, you know, I was uh, me and a few friends. We were kind of into gold and silver and uh, kind of Austrian economics and sound money. And uh, you know, we would talk about you know the the issues with the current financial system and you know how the you know the whole fiat money system is, is mm -hmm. kind of a, a grand experiment. Um, and then one of my friends came across Bitcoin and and a lot of the things that we had talked about. Um, and the premises of sound money really translated into Bitcoin. And obviously it was early stages and you know, nobody knew if it would gain any traction, but for me, it clicked right, right away. And um, yeah, that, that, that was basically the, the introduction. I, I bought a few dollars worth of Bitcoin for my friend on, on that day. Um, and uh, you know, it basically at the time it was really hard to buy and sell. Um, you kind of mm -hmm. meet somebody off of a site called local Bitcoins. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, from there, we kind of were trying to make it easier for people to buy and sell. And, uh, and that's when we started our first Bitcoin business. Good. So just because I know that people are going to ask, and I don't want this show to be about Bitcoins and what it is educational. This is about your journey as a, as a leader through it. But can you give the listeners and the people who are watching a really a five minute tutorial because a lot of people are going to look at this episode and goes, Oh, I want to learn more. So what is Bitcoin? How, how does crypto work in a very executive summary? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Bitcoin itself is the first digital currency that was ever created. Um, it, it's basically a peer to peer ledger. Um, essentially it, it's the first time that you've got digital scarcity and it's, it's often referred to as a digital version of gold. Okay. Um, where there's, there's a finite amount, there's only ever 21 million Bitcoin that'll ever be in existence. And, um, you know, the, the release mechanism is very similar to, to gold in the beginning, you could go and you could dig gold out of the ditch with a, you know, with a shovel and, yeah. um, and it was, you know, it was fairly abundant and, um, and over time it gets harder and harder to get and you require mm -hmm. more and more equipment. And so that's the same kind of system with Bitcoin. In the beginning, there was 50 Bitcoins that were released into the system every 10 minutes. And every four years, that be, that gets cut in half. So it's 25 Bitcoin and 12 and a half Bitcoin and so on. And, um, and, every, and as more and more people are trying to pull that Bitcoin out of the system, essentially, went through the mining equipment, um, it gets more and more competitive. And uh, you need more equipment, and so very similar to the you know gold mining industry, where you've got these gigantic mines and you know massive pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where the the Bitcoin mining industry has gone as well. Okay, and so just to summarize this, why are why is there a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency craze right now? Yeah, so so basically. Where Bitcoin is, is really shining right now it is kind of on that same premise of sound money. Um, you know, basically, 
the the world was on a gold standard for mm. oh, for, ever. You know, uh, yeah, <laughs> ever. For, 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 forever forever <laughs> absolutely and and you no know, but and so the the reason that gold worked well as a money is because there's a finite amount and, and it's it's hard to produce more of it and so it would it would hold its value um you know i couldn't just go and pull you know another two yeah, pounds yeah. of gold out of the out, out of the shed or you know print it in my backyard and uh and yeah, give yeah. it to you um and so it was something that was exchanged uh or it was used as a medium of exchange and so we got away from that um, in, you know, in around 1971 is when we find, when we like officially broke free of the gold standard. Um, and, and we went into the fiat standard, which is what's used around the world mm-hmm. right now. And, um, with that, you're basically trusting governments, um, to maintain, um, the, the money supply. And, and what we see with that is that governments around the world, um, uh, basically abuse that power and they, they print money out oh, of thin air. You, yeah. and, and so, you know, they, they basically say that there's, you know, target inflation and that we need the inflation. Mm-hmm. But what we've seen in the last year with, with COVID and the, the global pandemic is governments around the world have been printing mass amounts of money. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, and so when there's more money print, more money printed, um, you know, the dollars that are already in circulation are naturally worth less. Mm-hmm. And um, in the last year, about 18 months or so, um, 40%, there's been 40% more dollars created than existed prior to the pandemic. Wow. Uh, which is an astronomical amount. And so throughout history, what, what, what we've seen when, you know, money, more money is created and released into the system is we've seen periods of high inflation. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen this happen in countries around the world. And so traditionally, when people are trying to hedge against inflation, they'll run to hard assets. And, and yeah. gold has traditionally been that hedge. Um, but now we've got Bitcoin. <clears throat> and with Bitcoin, it's got a few advantages over gold um, where it, it's fully auditable. Anybody you know that understands the technology can go online and they can audit. And they can see that there's still only 21 billion Bitcoin. And you can transfer those Bitcoin around the world. And it's a lot easier to secure than gold. And so basically what we've got is companies, large companies around the world, basically moving large percentages of their cash into Bitcoin, um, rather as a hedge against inflation, um, where they would normally potentially move those assets or that cash into something like gold to hedge against inflation. And so this is, you know, basically a lot of large companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have kind of been publicly taking this position. And, uh, and it, it's really driven a, a lot of demand for the asset. It's, it's crazy because it's, it's like that toilet paper, Costco toilet paper thing, right? Somebody buys one and you go, why do I need more? And then everybody just dives into it. So that kind of matches, you know, you've, you've um, summarized explosive growth. So tell me, how do you, how does your story fit in all of this? Right? So when did you think that, you know, you started doing this and you said, you realized you said, Oh shit, this is, this is going to take off. This is going to be how, how far back and what was your thought? So right away, I, I understood that there was something significant about Bitcoin. Like it clicked fairly quickly. Um, I always knew based maybe not always, but, uh, yeah. you know, just, just after prior to discovering Bitcoin, you know, I was really becoming familiar with the financial system and, you know, the, the need for, um, sound money, um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, the damages that fiat money were actually doing to society. And so when I discovered Bitcoin, it immediately clicked to me that, you know, this could be a potential, um, you know, uh, alternative to, to dollars. And, and this could be a way for, you know, people and governments to opt into this system and return to a sound money system, mm-hmm. um, you know, that, that wasn't possible before. And so I, I think it clicked fairly quickly for me. Um, and then, you know, it was basically just, it's taken a lot of time and I think there's still ways to go as more and more infrastructure is built to actually, you know, potentially achieve that. Um, but, you know, ultimately when I first discovered it, just the, the underlying technology that made it possible, um, was really interesting to me as well, because there was never the ability to have, you know, fully full scarcity in the digital item. Mm-hmm. If I sent you a photo, you could duplicate it, you know, a thousand times and, and distribute it. And so this was the first time that there was true digital scarcity. And so, so I knew right then that that in itself was a breakthrough. And then, you know, when I thought about the sound money principles that, uh, that I was a fan of, um, 
you know, I thought that there was definitely something here. And I think even, you know, the growth that we've seen over the last 10 years, you know, really exceeds what I, you know, thought was possible, but, mm-hmm. you know, as we continue to build and markets continue to evolve and people, you know, entrepreneurs around the world continue to build these systems, um, you know, it really shows you what, what's actually possible. Yeah. So what, uh, so tell us a little bit. So you, you've jumped, you jump into crypto in what, 2013, you said, right? That's right. Yeah. So now we're in 2021. What's the, what's the journey like for you? Like what were your, your trials, tribulation, your big wins, your big challenges, All right? Let's start with struggling. What did you struggle most when you first started and then kind of up to now? Yeah, absolutely. So, so when I first started, um, like I said, buying and selling was just a challenge in itself. And mm-hmm. so, we had to like wire transfer money offshore into some <laughs> some online exchange that uh, you know, nobody really knew, and it took a few weeks, and we weren't really sure if the money was actually going to arrive, and uh, and it did. Um, but obviously, we knew that that buying experience wasn't going to be scalable, and most people weren't going to go through that. And you know, yeah. as people kind of learned about it, uh, that there would be demand for a more accessible route. And so, basically, what we did is we created. Um, uh, probably one of the world's first in-person brokerages. Um, what? We, we rented, we rented a, uh, a retail space just down by Granville Island in Vancouver and, um, and set up an office where people could come in and they could talk about crypto and they could learn about it and they could buy it and sell it. And this was basically born, um, from necessity after, you know, doing a few of those, um, peer to peer in person deals, um, you know, and people being uncomfortable with it. Um, I immediately realized that, you know, we need a place that people, we can build a reputation and people are, know that we're going to be here tomorrow. And, you know, because you're dealing with people's money and, you know, it's, it's new and it's confusing. And so, you know, we, we saw the need for a location that, you know, you could help answer those questions and make people feel more comfortable and kind of, you know, connect the, uh, digital world with the physical world. Yeah. You don't want to be the the guy who drives a virtual sketchy white van, right? Go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. So, so, so you've got yourself a place, you're up and running. What else, what other trials and tribulations have you faced since? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so right in the beginning, um, you know, there was obviously a lot of people just like had no idea what we were talking about. And so the, the first trial and tribulation I would say was kind of just, you know, the, the vast majority of the population saying, you know, what the hell are you guys talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 nobody, nobody cares about your magical internet money, but, uh, but there was a surprising, you know, very niche market that actually understood it and wanted to learn about it. And a community developed around that business really quickly and, and it started to grow. Um, and then from there, you know, the, the initial challenge was how do we scale this and you yeah. know, will people continue to care and is this going to stick around? And so that's when we actually we made an agreement with the company out in Nevada or sorry, out of Reno, Nevada, um, to secure the world's first Bitcoin ATMs. And, uh, and so from there, we, we got the world's first Bitcoin ATM. We launched that in Vancouver in the fall of 2013. And, um, and then we, we ended up rolling those ATMs out around the world. We set up ATMs in Singapore and London and Tokyo and in Bucharest. Um, and so obviously, you know, scaling a business with physical hardware, um, you know, into locations around the world came with its challenges as well. Um, and all the, all the, meanwhile, you know, the banks didn't really understand what we're dealing with. Regulars <laughs> didn't understand what we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, and the vast majority of the population didn't understand what we're dealing with. So there's a lot of education. So tell me, how, how is the support, right? Because you've got this crazy idea. You're like, holy shit, I got something here, right? And how is your support? Parents, family, friends, was it 50-50? Did they all say you're crazy? Did, were they supportive? What was the? Yeah, I, I think they were pretty used to me kind of trying different businesses. I've had a variety <laughs> of different businesses over the years. And so, you know, the, the support has always been there, um, you know, and, and it's kind of just, you know, they, they just, that's what Mitchell does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, there, there's been, you know, several different types of ventures and, uh, you know, and, and it would change often and, uh, always just trying new things. And so, you know, they, they were kind of just there, even if they didn't understand it, they're there to support me and help where they could. People underestimate the timing. Yeah. So a lot of people out there who are CEOs or entrepreneurs, let's talk about entrepreneurs. They say, oh, 
you know, just work harder, work harder. It's not true. It's consistency is key because timing is very important, right? Absolutely. If you would have done this 10 years from now, or, uh, you know, uh, maybe 11 or 15 years from now, then maybe the timing wasn't there. But then if you, you kept at it, you kept at it. And all of a sudden you've got momentum because the timing is right. So people underestimate the opportunity, the timing. They say, Oh, you're lucky. Well, Yes and no. The demand is there now. It's just that I've been providing that service for longer and then now it's picking up. So yeah. that's a that's a, a thing that people don't necessarily understand. They say, oh, well, work harder. Well, no, is timing is key. So yeah. what are so let let's stay on this explosive growth. What are your current trials and tribulations? So so you were so you joined 2018 and then you became president yeah. 2019. So when you first joined, how many people were in Netcoins? Uh, when I first joined the company, there was about two or three of us in the company. It was it was still very early. Um, the company had kind of raised some capital on on the back of some early stage growth, but uh, it was the original founder, uh, Mark Baines, who's the current CEO of Big Digital, which is the parent company. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then Mark brought me in. Um, you know, he, Mark had some success and a lot of experience building tech companies. And, and uh, you know, I, I had that crypto background. And so, so a friend of mine connected me with Mark and, uh, and, and I joined the company and it was still really early. Like there, we, we, we struggled a little bit to find a good product market fit. Mm -hmm. I brought some of my experience, um, you know, from the previous years into, into the business. And we did some, you know, larger brokerage stuff and provided liquidity to other, uh, other crypto platforms that were doing similar things. Um, but we really, you know, didn't really find our groove until I would say halfway through 2019. And that's when we decided to go full retail facing. Um, we kind of, you know, tore out a lot of the stuff that we had built prior mm -hmm. and, um, and, and just focused on Canada and just decided to make it, you know, give Canadians the most secure, trusted and easiest place to, to buy and sell crypto. And that's kind of what we've built now. And, and that's where we're seeing the, the major growth. Okay, so now how many how many people are working for Netcoins? Um, inside the company, we've got about twenty seven people right now. Yeah. <laughs> Two yeah. to twenty seven. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and, and we're we're actively hiring. Yeah. Uh, uh one of the clients that I have as well. When we look at the trajectory, you go, how many people were on the Zoom call last year? Twelve. How many people are in the Zoom call now? Forty four. And you're like, yeah. shit. That's a lot of people. People don't. Uh, so a lot of people underestimate also the importance of attitude, skill, and knowledge in that order. We say, oh, we need somebody with crypto experience. Well, hold on a minute, Jackson. Let's hire somebody with the right attitude first, then the right skill and the experience can come after. Right. So that's, that's key in that learning. I think that's, um, and the other thing, I don't know if you guys do that, but having a very clear code of conduct that is drafted from your core values so that people understand here's the type of people that we are at Netcoins and here's the type of people that we want to hire. Do you guys have that? You guys do that? We, we don't have it written up, um, but but it, it's something that I communicate, um, you know, very strongly with the team. And, and as I'm hiring, I'm always looking for people that kind of come in with that entrepreneurial mindset. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, I like to, and I've been really fortunate. I've, I've been surrounded by an amazing team over the last few years. And, you know, th there's a lot of different pieces of the business that we've kind of got divided into segments and, and I can really rely on those people to kind of problem problem solve, you know, the things as they come up in, in their area of expertise and kind of build out their departments as if they're building, you know, their own businesses as an entrepreneur. And I think that's really important because, you know, no matter what business you're in, you're always going to have, you know, multiple problems. And, and I think even as a leader, you can't necessarily be addressing every problem as it comes up. And so I think it's important to, you know, surround yourself by problem solvers and, and people that are, you know, ready to just take things on as they come. I, I, you know, uh, that term is often overutilized, right? And, and kind of uh, is a buzzword, entrepreneurial spirit. When you break that down, what does that mean? I think problem solver is number one, right? Like you said. Yeah, absolutely. 
uh, this this nonstop grit of saying, you know, yeah, for sure, you know, I'll tackle the day as what it brings on, right? So that's that's another thing. Think of uh, positivity versus being optimist. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, shit can happen, but yeah, okay, shit happens. How do I deal with it? How do I solve absolutely. that problem? That's yeah. that's critical, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I think as an entrepreneur, that's that's a lot of what you're doing is just solving problems all day long and then putting out fires and you know dealing it with things as they come up. And and I think it's really important. And you know, one thing that I really look for when I'm hiring is is making sure that you know we're find we're hiring and bringing people in that are solution oriented. It's mm-hmm. really easy to to point out problems, but uh you know finding solutions is, is what's important and what propels the business forward. And so you know finding solutions and, and acting quick and you know adapting is, is really important. Personal leadership for me is is a key thing to somebody who understands like they take self care doesn't mean selfish right so yeah, yeah. you need to figure out and 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 on the black side so that was on the on the dark side of entrepreneurial is that you have people that are extremely reactive that yeah. don't necessarily know how to plan the work and then work the plan they just yeah. go from from fire to fire to fire to fire to fire and that's very that's very uh, addictive and that's where the wrong chemicals can be injected into an organization because I, ha- I have uh, our team of partners. We currently have a few organizations that we serve that have that issue saying, okay, the team that took you from zero to 100 is not the team that's going to take you from 100 to 1000. And yep. that's what a lot of companies have a hard time too. I don't want to let go of Jimmy. Well, why? Well, Jimmy worked hard. Yeah, Jimmy's got the right attitude for startup. And he's not a continuous improvement guy, right? Like yep. you said before, I think it was in a pre show. Can't remember. It was like, yeah, I love all this, this fun stuff. I'm not a guy who's going to look at numbers and, and dive down into measuring everything and ensuring that we've got efficiencies, capabilities, capacity. That's what we do, right? And that's yeah. as a fractional chief operating officer, uh, me and my team and my other partners, that's what we do. We say, okay, great. Yeah. You've done a great job. You've started the engine. You've got everything. My job is to make sure that we change the bolts while we're driving right and then so that the wheels don't fall off so that's i think that's a lesson for explosive growth companies but then like you said you know you're growing 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 so that you're never letting go of that 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 hockey stick kind of growth so you have to keep on going Absolutely. I, I've always thrived and enjoyed the the early stages of figuring things out and, and growing and, you know, adding things on and going in and where I kind of start to lose my, my fire is, is when you get into that operational stage of a business and you're kind of just, you know, just, just gliding along and it's kind of just day to day. And that's what I love about this industry is that, you know, it, it's evolving so quickly. There's, there's so many things that come up and that, uh, you know, where there's so much room for growth in different directions and, um, you know, every day it kind of brings its own challenges and, and every day you're kind of, you know, making that progress. And so it, it's never stagnant or, you know, sideways. So let's let that takes us. That's a great positioning for the second component of this, this show, which is uh, emerging industry, right? So how are you with all the problems that you have to solve? Are you making time to look at what the industry, where the industry is going? Or are you just kind of burying your head and going, holy shit, got to get this done, got to get this done, got to get this done. Are you able to put your head up and see what's coming up? Absolutely. I, I, I try my best. Like there's, there's always a balance, obviously. And there's mm-hmm. times where it's head down and you just got stuff to do and you, you know, you're building out that infrastructure, but I, I try, I basically try to, you know, build the infrastructure and give myself enough room. I, I think it's really important that, you know, somebody that's leading a company like this can actually breathe and look around and isn't, you know, head down in the operation. And so I've been trying to scale the team up and, you know, sometimes the, the growth exceeds the, the capacity <laughs> of the team and you got to put your head down, but, but ultimately that that's where I like to be. And, um, you know, I make a point of getting up every morning, going for like an hour walk and listen to a podcast, catch up on industry news and, you know, the top thought leaders make sure that i'm kind of staying up to speed and you know ahead of you know the, what what the industry is doing um because it's really easy to fall behind and if you're not making that time it uh you know you, you can get bogged down and just kind of get set in your ways 
It's so that, you know, a, so business is very simple and a lot of people don't understand that. So there's fe- four components, fear, four components of a business leadership or governance, how you, you know, what's your, what's this great idea? How do you grow the idea, which is innovation, marketing, and sales. So a lot of CEO, CEOs fall into the operational component. Well, I got to look at the finance. I got to look at how are we doing this? Where because they're so visionary, they need to stay focused on the growth side of things, mm-hmm. which is how do I how do I keep the organization innovative so that it is always in that entrepreneurial place, if you want to call it that. How do I market? And you're the best person to sell because you're the one that came up with the idea. So mm-hmm. I mean that's that's key into into that. So with that explosive growth, where do you see the issues? some of the issues and wins maybe that you guys are going to be faced with in the coming year, right? Cause COVID's yeah. not going anywhere and, and we're coming back, but. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think the, the issues that we're encountering are, you know, they're, they're, they're somewhat uh, common, um, but they're, you know, a little more, in depth for our industry. Um, the cryptocurrency industry, you know, already has a, a very high level of scrutiny and mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of under a microscope by the regulators, by the banks. And, uh, we're also, you know, a constant target for uh, cyber crime and fraud. And so, you know, it comes with all those challenges. And, um, and I think, you know, basically leading those conversations with the banks, being proactive about our cybersecurity and leading the conversations with the regulators and helping them understand working on i think those are big challenges but uh but they're they're kind of a necessary part of the business and and it definitely feels like we've been making some progress there um but i think those are also pieces of the business that that are challenging for us that a lot of other industries don't ever have to deal with you know if you're you know there, there's a ton of different industries where you know banking is just a, it's just a, an amenity that's there and you don't really <laughs> need to think about it right um for us we've been fortunate we've got some good banking relationships but uh but you know the the space changes really quick and uh you know something that's great today is, isn't so great tomorrow potentially right and so it, it's always evolving and uh it's something that we're thinking about every single day and uh you know having redundancy for a piece of business that is often quite trivial for most businesses. Um, and then, you know, on the regulatory side, that, that regulatory side of the business is evolving every day as well. And so, you know, that that's something that, you know, again, is usually quite trivial for most businesses, but it's it's a very high touch item for us. Um, and then just overall compliance with money service type stuff, uh, broad mitigation. And then, you know, on top of all of that, we, we still need to build a business. Oh, I hear you. I We, we do a lot of underwriting. All right. So I'm uh, one of my personal clients is in real money betting. Right. So we've we've gone into in October 31st, 2020, you know, the banking system said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Or the government in the U.S. said, hey, hold on a second. You guys are just way too frivolous with how you're handing over some of the stuff. So, you know, you go through the underwriting with the bank. The bank goes directly to Visa, MasterCard, and ultimately the credit card is the one that holds on to that. But being able to go with OFAC, knowing your customer, KYC, I mean, there's so many levels now that you need to be on top of. You know, you guys are killing the phrase cash is king, right? So, uh it's funny because I have a safe in my house and I keep I keep some cash in there. But when all of this happened, right? Because for emergencies, I've I've done contingency planning and business continuity for for a very long time. Uh, I did it for Shell and and big mining organization and oil and gas. And then you realize, well, hold on a second. That's you know that's not it's not true anymore. That doesn't hold anymore because during the pandemic, nobody was accepting cash. Yeah. Nobody was accepting cash. I'm like, I'm not yeah. touching your money. I'm like, and I can think, I think I had got a $20 bill that's been in my wallet for like six months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't touched it at all. So in the, so who are you seeing? Do you have competitors is, or, or rivals? I maybe would be a better term because then, you know, there's a whole bunch of things. Is there a need for association? Is there a need for, 
regulation? Is there a need for a different body? Is like I think of World Health Organization. You know, this globalization, it's funny because the world right now is between two spectrums. We need to globalize as much as we can, but nobody's allowed to travel, which is very opposites, right? So you you see some of the wildlife that comes back into uh, Burrard Inlet. That's an inlet in Vancouver. They've seen a pot of whales for the first time in, in 15 years. So yeah. I think the winds of change is, and I can't, you guys are just riding on top of this, right? It just, but is Netcoin one of the only ones? Do you have competitors? Do you have rivals? Yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot of different platforms um, in Canada and we're all kind of working towards the same goal. And so I wouldn't say we're rivals. There's, there's actually a lot of cooperation in oh, the good. industry. Um, you know, I, I think the, the goal of, you know, cryptocurrency mass adoption and, you know, helping educate people on, on what we're working with here and kind of demystifying it is a common goal amongst all these companies or most of them anyways. And so with that, it brings a lot of cooperation. And so, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is kind of educating the, the regulators on what we're dealing with and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, making them feel comfortable and kind of helping them adjust their legacy policies to address a, a new global emerging industry. Yeah. Cause I mean, uh, in, I, I know for a fact that in Canada, there are what four big banks, five big banks there yeah. and very regulated the banking structure. So I'm, uh, do you know if Europe is in uh, other countries are as regulated as Canada? Cause I know U S is a bit l- lenient and more uh, capitalist. Yeah. Yeah. It, it varies bank to bank or so, sorry, it varies country to country. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, is the banks don't want to step offside with, mm-hmm. with the regulators and the regulators are, you know, fragmented around the world. And so, you know, there's a lot of work being done and I think we'll get there, but it's just going to take some time. And, you know, we've been working on this for, since I've been in the industry, you know, when we first started back in 2013, uh, the banks didn't want to work with us because they didn't understand what we're dealing with and they didn't want to be upside with the regulators. And so, you know, and then the regulators are kind of, you know, they, they want, they need to be cautious and they need to make sure they understand it and they need to understand the implications of the rules and guidelines that they set in. And so, you know, it's something that can't really be rushed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, it just takes a lot of conversations and, and you know, a lot of years to, to get things in place properly the world is changing. So the banks are going to have to adapt because soon cash will not be king. Gold will not be worth as much as it is. Uh, It's more going to be diversified. So, yeah. Yeah, And I definitely feel for the banks as they're trying to adapt uh, to, you know, these these changing times, because you've got these, you know, behemoths of of organizations with, you know, 40, 50,000 people employed and, you know, they they get very bureaucratic and it takes Mm -hmm. time to to change policies and to address technology. And you're definitely not as nimble as, you know, different fintech companies and, you know, have the ability to, to make those changes quick. And even myself, as I see the company uh, growing at Netcoins, you know, the things that we could usually, you know, just make a stroke of a pen or, or an idea comes up <laughs> and we, we, you know, change some code that afternoon and ship it out. Things take a little more time. Products get more complex. Procedures get more complex. There's more kind of, you know, more people at the table. And so, it's it's really not as easy for the banks to just you know take you know 200 years of uh, of history and you know start to change the way that they're doing things because there's there's so many different people at the table and you know there's there's all kinds of things that they need to deal with but you know as you get that kind of bloat inside of an organization even inside of a bank you kind of leave yourself susceptible to disruption yeah i mean the the it, it, I see this great leveler coming through where credit is important. I mean, banks are trying to un, outdo each other by selling more services, right? So they go, hey, listen, I'll reduce your bank account monthly, you know, service fee if you take this on, if you take that on. So they're they're looking at surviving as well. So and then you get guys like Elon Musk who spends what, how many billion dollars? It's like, okay, I'm just gonna buy as many bitcoins as I can. Boom. Right. Yeah. So talk about disruption. <laughs> Absolutely. So industry is 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 leading the way, and there you're there to service that need for them, which is 
you know, banks, either you roll with us or get the hell out of the way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let, let's move on to highly scrutinized area. Where, where are your areas for opportunity in educating all these auditors? Cause there's auditors of auditors. So just for the, for the public and people who are listening, you, you know, uh, Mitchell just doesn't go out saying, Hey, I'm going to print out 50 bitcoins and just sell them. So can you explain the process and what you have to deal with on a day-to-day basis, all the levels of, of verification that you have to go through? Yeah, absolutely. So being in a new industry and being owned by a public company, big digital assets, um, we we're, we undergo annual audits. And, um, and basically, you know, being in a new high risk industry, um, you know, and, and having some, some notable events happen in Canada, some stuff like Quadriga mm-hmm. and, and things like Einstein, um, you know, the, the auditors before they're able to sign off on, on what we're doing, um, they really need to make sure they're comfortable. And, and part of that is being comfortable with our counterparties, being comfortable with our storage, our insurance, our internal policies and procedures, um, everything from, from start to finish of the business. And, um, you know, and so, and then there's a lot of education that needs to happen with what we're doing and what we're dealing with. Um, and so even if we can get our auditors comfortable, there's an organization that kind of is behind the auditors that, that needs to be comfortable as well. And they kind of come in and, and review the auditor's work to make sure that everything is being done properly and that they, they haven't missed anything or there's you know no opportunities for fraud. And so at the end of the day, it, it's, it's a rigorous process, but, um, but, you know, we, we kind of welcome that level of scrutiny because it, you know, gives our user base, um, you know, a, a higher level of trust. And, and if these processes were in place, um, for crypto companies years ago, then, you know, it could have saved a lot of heartache for all the people mm-hmm. that lost their money in, in Quadriga. And, and so it's a similar process that we're going through with the, with the regulators where mm-hmm. basically we need to show them, you know, this is how our system works. This is how we secure funds. This is how everything's insured. And, uh, you know, this is how we bet it. And this is our policies. And, and, you know, basically, you know, fully, fully show them behind the curtain and, and make them comfortable uh, as comfortable as possible um, and help them understand exactly what we're dealing with so that they can, you know, have some confidence in knowing that, you know, there's not going to be fraud and there's not, you know, customer funds and investor funds aren't at risk. I want to go through your, cause you guys are 100% remote, right? So tell me as the leader of a remote workforce, where do you, where do your, you said 24, 26. I can't remember how many people you had. Yeah. About 20, 26, 27, somewhere in there yeah, right 26, now. We're, we're uh, yeah. Cause yeah, there's always one new, Oh, hi, hi. Yeah, yeah, oh, hi. Yeah, who are absolutely. you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's go with 27. So where are the 27 people? Um, most likely continents. You don't have to necessarily pinpoint, but where? Yeah, we're mostly in Canada um, and, okay. and, and spread out across the country fairly evenly now. Um, and yeah, it's definitely been a bit different leading a team. Personally, mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur, I've, I've spent a ton of time working independently, working at home, mm-hmm. and, and I've always enjoyed it. Um, I've never really worked in an office like we, mm-hmm. we, we did for the last few years leading up to COVID, but uh, you know, I find myself more productive um, working remote, but I think there's definitely things that, you know, I've had to adapt in, in kind of my management style. And I think you need to be more intentional about making time and getting FaceTime with people. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially after you have like, you know, obviously there's going to be hard conversations at times and, you know, we're not going to pass each other at the water cooler. And so, you you know, I think it's important about to be intentional, um, you know, to, to make time for small talk and, and, uh, you know, to create time for, you know, that, that social aspect of, of the workplace um while being fully remote well and so what do you guys do for for do you, how, so how do you do it yeah how yeah, do you do so, that soft so, stuff? so in, in the beginning in the beginning we had um we we had a couple remote kind of zoom happy hours like a lot of people were doing <laughs> yeah. um and i wasn't a big fan of those it was they're kind of awkward and yeah, you know yeah. it's, it's kind of nobody really knows what to say and so what we started doing is is um is hosting um we, we we've had a few people in so we, we did a trivia day 
um, where a gentleman came in and, and did like an online trivia, kind of like a, a bar style. Uh, we've had different video game type that oh, nights nice. where basically everybody meets up and we, we did, we did a, um, what is it? A, an escape room, a, a virtual escape oh, room, nice. uh, which was fun. And, you know, and then there's different, you know, different uh, parts of the company have their, their kind of weekly traditions where they meet up online and have lunch together and, oh, cool. you know, or bubble tea. One, one of the groups does, oh. and you know, they play games each, each week of one of the people organizes their own kind of game. So, so yeah, I, I, but I think, you know, making sure that those things are happening and that you're intentional about them, um, I found important. Um, and then, like I said, you know, after you have a hard conversation, getting back on the phone and saying, Hey, look, you know, like I'm not, I'm not mad at you. You know, that, like you know, we're, we're just trying to work through some stuff and it's nothing personal and making sure that you, you know, you do that follow up. I think is important. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you, you kind of close your computer, walk away and, you know, you don't talk for a couple of days. It'd be a pretty, un- it'd be a pretty unhealthy work environment. Oh, boba is from bubble tea. That's another commodity that's going to be rare, like bitcoins yeah, yeah. too. So, so the the canal of Suez had a whole bunch of tapioca on there, and so there's oh, a no shortage. Way. There's a shortage of bubble tea pearls. That uh, so if you can't get your bubble tea is because the, it was on that boat on that that super tanker or super haul or whatever you want to call it. So that was pretty neat. Shoot. <laughs> the, 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 there's going to be a couple of my a couple people in my company that aren't happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your what are you afraid of? Um, so you're you're successful. You've done good. What are you afraid of? Um, that's a good question. I think, um, yeah, I don't really know, actually. Um, o- overall, I-, I think I've done a fairly good drop- job of kind of addressing my fears. Um, you know, I-, I, like to, I like to be comfortable and I like to be challenged. Um, and I like to spend time with family. I think, you know, overall, um, yeah, that, that, that's a good, that's a really good question. I, I haven't really put a lot of thought into. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, part of my concern around the pandemic right now is, you know, if the travel restrictions continue and, you know, it makes it difficult to, to see family and that we don't ever really get back into, you know, a, uh, a state where, you know, human interaction in, mm-hmm. in person, uh, I, I think that could be troublesome. Um, but uh yeah, overall, I, I don't really live with a lot of fears. I, I, I think, you know, when, whenever there's something that I am afraid of or, you know, that is bothering me, I, I kind of just try to address that underlying issue. And, and so I'd say at the end of the day, there's there's not a lot that I'm overly afraid of. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, pain or gain drives decision, right? So if you can't mm-hmm. find that through gain, I mean, Tim Ferriss does a good fear mm-hmm. setting. Um, for me as it's to provide for my family. So for mm-hmm. when I go into business, I've always got this scarcity mentality and sometimes it plays well in regards to business development and, and getting through things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it always works sometimes against me because then I, I feel the need to always work more. And that's yeah. that sometimes that entrepreneurial spit that you said is you don't necessarily balance your lifestyle. So that, uh, yeah. That's a fear that I've got. So, yeah, um, I, I, I would say, you know, now, now that we break that down, I, I would say you know, that that is a little bit of a fear. And my wife and I have talked about that, um, you know, that uh, I, I do kind of fear that that I work too much sometimes. Uh, and, and, you know, like I, I don't have a lot of like outside hobbies, uh, you know, outside <laughs> of business. I, 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 I love business. I talk about business, but all the time and. You know, a friend of mine asked me a couple of weeks ago if I'll eventually start golfing or find any other hobbies or if I'm just always going to build companies. And uh, because, like, I, I like to talk about business and I like to hang out with people that are building businesses. We yeah. talk about the business they're building and what they're, the challenges they're encountering. And it's kind of just, you know, that's what, what my, where my passion is. And, you know, nothing really gets me fired up quite as much. But on the flip side of that, um, you know, I do get kind of caught up in it and because it's work and it's not like a hobby, like, you know, if, if you were to spend 12 <laughs> hours a day golfing, um, you know, it'd be pretty easy for people to come in and say, Hey, well, you, you just missed, uh, so-and-so's birthday because you're golfing. 
<laughs> but if, when you're working and you know you're building businesses, then it's you know it, it's easy to justify. And so I think I am partially afraid of um, you know missing a lot of life because I'm so kind of involved in, in business and, and I'm so you know like you know in, in it and, and and so occupied by it. And you know th- there have been times where I miss out on things and um, you know and and so I do think as I kind of move into the next stage of my life, where you know we talk about having kids and stuff, that you know I, I am slightly afraid of getting too involved in business where, you know, you, you miss things. Right. And, and thank you for that because it is, it is the curse of young, successful entrepreneurs like you. You're so good at it. You're and, and wow, this is what I love to do and I'm good at it. I enjoy it. I also love my wife. We want to have a family. And then you have to say, well, okay, so hold on a second. What is the priority? Mm-hmm. All right. How do I tackle this? How do I? And you're in an explosive growth. You're in a scrutinize it. You've got emerging industry. There's a lot of things that work in your favor, but it also, it's the double-edged sword, right? It's the other side of the equation. You say, okay, well, I need balance. And the best way to do it is really build a solid routine. Right. And so yeah. if you say, well, I'm shutting her down because that's what I do. All right. So I, at, at 5 p.m. PST for me is I shut everything down. Well, I actually shut things down at 430 PST because I close my day out. So I was like, OK, yeah. what did I do today? You know, just kind of go through my meetings, action items for tomorrow. I start my day pretty early, usually 430 because I've got people in Poland across different time mm-hmm. zones. So then. I do my work first thing in the morning. Then I take a break. I go work out, do walk the dog, have breakfast with my family, and then I can jump back into it. And that's something that uh, entrepreneurs, if we go with that entrepreneur, especially where you're at, because if there's no end in sight at a certain point, you're going to have to inject that saying, oh, hold on a second. You know, uh, Julius Caesar, Mahatma Gandhi, even Jesus Christ himself had only 24 hours a day, <laughs> which, yeah, is, which is which is the same thing that you and I have. So that's that's also the the feeling of putting more on. So uh, with that said, what's the what is the one piece of resource, maybe a podcast or a book that you go back to that is your kind of Bible in business? And you go, hey, listen, now this is this is the the system that I always use. What's that? Um, so the, the one podcast that I find really resourceful is, uh, is one I just recently what started CEOs talking about. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> pulled the words right out of my mouth. Uh, um, I, I've actually been really enjoying, uh, my first million. Okay. Um, and, and so, so basically on that show, they, they break down businesses and they, they talk about business and they kind of dissect it. And as I mentioned earlier, that's kind of what I enjoy doing mm-hmm. with, with my friends is, is kind of, you know, assessing businesses and, you know, look at something and break it down and you know, how do they make money? What are their costs? And, you know, how yeah. does this work and what would I do differently? And that's kind of what they talk about on the show. And, and I enjoy it because it kind of just gets your, your entrepreneurial, you know, brain turning and you kind of, you know, think through things with them and then, you know, think about how you would do things differently. And so for me, it's, that's kind of like a, you know, it it just kind of clears my mind a little bit and and it just gives you ideas and, you know, there's so many different things. And so I I think that's really enjoyable. Oh, good. Good. Uh, uh, Last question is what are you working on right now? So you're the, you're the president of net net coins, you as an individual, as a leader, where is your area for improvement that you you own? This is something that I have to improve and that I'm working on. So do you mean like inside the business or for me personally? Uh, I guess it would be a bit of both. Let's go for both, right? So mm-hmm. what, are you strug- what are you looking at doing as the leader of the organization? But also personally, what's your area for improvement? You go, like, I need to be better at this. Therefore, I'm yeah. going to work at that. Yeah. So, so one of the main things I'm working on inside the business right now is, is just building up the team and, mm-hmm. and kind of figuring out that, that structure of the organization uh, to kind of bring it to that next level. Like, like we've talked about, we've, we've had a lot of growth. And so with that, you know, there, there's just a, an increased workload across the board. And so it's kind of just, you know, 
deciding on, you know, the, the proper structure and who those, what those roles look like, helping define those and then finding the right person and then making sure that they've got, got the resources and, uh, you know, they, they understand what they're responsible for and, and positioning them best for success. And so that's kind of where I'm at in the business, but at the same time, I'm still, you know, looking, you know, one, three, five years out as well as six months mm-hmm. out and, uh, you know, and kind of trying to deal with some of the, the bigger macro problems and, and things that we're dealing with. Um, as, as an individual, I think that there's always just room for me to, to be a little more, um, I, I would say kind of, you know, making sure that I've got the time to, to be, um, a, a little more granular on, on certain levels gotcha. because there's certain pieces of the business where I, I do heavily rely on, on kind of the department heads. Um, mm-hmm. but I, I do, you know, as I scale the team up, I, I do want to get to a position where I've got more of my own time that I can kind of lend an ear and, and kind of, you know, help those people out and, and, you know, spends more time with them and address, you know, the things that they're encountering because right now, you know, everybody is, is I'm sure encountering their own struggles mm-hmm. in their own departments, but, you know, we've got the, the bigger, you know, business that, uh, that, you know, we're, we're scaling up really quickly. And so it, it's kind of spread me a little bit thin. And so it's kind of, you know, I, and I think it's a natural progression of the business. There's always going to be times where, you know, you're slightly overstaffed or, or you're understaffed and you just need to kind of, you know, adapt and, and build to those levels. But, you know, during those, times where, you know, we're slightly understaffed because the growth is so rapid, um, you know, getting, you know, back to a position where, you know, we can breathe a little bit and then kind of make sure that I'm supporting the team as much as I can. There's, there's one thing that I always tell CEOs, the first thing that you should do when is to always, without knowing everything without of every department is to have one major and two minors. So like, for example, sales, what's the major KPI and the two minor KPIs that I'm going to ask my, you know, VP of sales in operations, what's the major and and two minors that I've got so that I'm always kind of got like a little bit of a triangulation on what they're doing and how they're doing it. So that's, uh, that's, that's that's great. Yeah. Uh, Mitchell, are you okay if people want to reach out to you, if they have other questions? Absolutely. Yeah. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, just Mitchell Demeter, um, or on Twitter, uh, at Mitchell Demeter as well. Oh, you got a and Twitter then, account. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look absolutely. At you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we, we built out some great resources on Netcoins. We, we built out a section of the website called the Academy. Um, oh, that's really sweet. focused on, you know, education and kind of addressing a lot of those questions that people, um, you always have when they're first starting to learn about crypto. And so, so that's a great resource. And we've got, got a great support team there. That's, uh, you know, always happy to, to chat crypto and answer any questions that people might have. Sweet. Fabulous. Well, thank you very, very much for being on the show, Mitchell. It's so nice. Appreciate so jealous. On. Look at that. Sun's coming out just cause you're here. <laughs> uh, I am in Vancouver as well. So sun is coming out Pacific Northwest, always rainy. It's nice to see some sun. Uh, with that said, thank you very much. Beautiful. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. My name is Martin Hunter. I'm the host of What CEOs Talk About, where we translate strategy into frontline operations. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to What CEOs Talk About. Make sure to click subscribe to get notified about future episodes or check us out at www.whatceostalkabout.com.